Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Melvin Kelly, and it's my uh, distinct honor and privilege to serve as the moderator uh, for our panel on contemporary law and policy uh, strategies to redress black land loss. Uh, and so uh, in order to avoid being uh, redundant uh, at this stage of the game in terms of introducing the panelists um, who you had an opportunity to get acquainted with, I'll be pretty uh, brief. Uh, but I will say that um, as we're pivoting into this afternoon, uh, this should be a moment for us to also ensure that we have um, some additional time for some questions uh, that have been on the table. Uh, we're looking more kind of uh, into the solutions after getting a little bit of a deeper understanding of the history around land laws, as well as uh, different policies and practices that have contributed to inequitable access to housing opportunities uh, and home ownership. Uh, and so we'll hear from uh, three folks uh, this afternoon uh, in this panel. Uh, again, my name is Melvin Kelly. Uh, I'm an associate professor with a dual appointment at Northeastern University within the School of Law and the DeMore McKim School of Business. Uh, and uh, I'm also a faculty fellow with the Center for Law and Equity and Race at our institution. And, in a, uh, and I serve on the advisory board of our Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, uh, which is an initiative that investigates racially motivated homicides uh, to excavate and uh, remediate uh, histories and intergener intergenerational implications of state sanctioned and state condoned violence. Uh, first, uh, with respect to our, our panel, uh, we'll hear from Thomas Mitchell. Uh, many thanks to Thomas Mitchell uh, for the invitation, as well as for, uh, to the conference organizers for bringing us all together. Uh, as you folks know, Tom Thomas Mitchell is a professor here at uh, BC uh, School of Law. Uh, we had an opportunity to hear about his work uh, with his team of scholars examining land loss. Uh, we'll be pivoting to hear a little bit more about his instrumental work uh, in advocacy uh, as the principal drafter of model state legislation to reduce property loss among disadvantaged families uh, that are disproportionately black. And so that will give us an opportunity to think about legislative reform. Uh, we will then turn to uh, Bryce Stuckey, uh, who is an independent research and reporter based in Washington, D.C., uh, and we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to hear from him a little bit more about sort of the prospects for administrative reform. Uh, and then finally, we will welcome back uh, Attorney George Fathery III, uh, who we've heard from at, the, um, at our fireside chat just a moment ago. Uh, and as you now know, one of, our, one of the country's leading strategic legal advisors in a wide array of large and complex commercial uh, real estate transactions uh, and has done such groundbreaking work uh, including serving as a lead attorney in the historic return of the Bruce's Breach property. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Thomas Mitchell. So I'm Professor Thomas, M okay, I think. Um, <laughs> all right, so what I'm gonna talk about today in terms of uh, potential solutions is talking about um, legislative and policy solutions. I'm also going to expand it a little bit and talk about some things that educational institutions, higher education can do to help uh, protect property rights for disadvantaged people. Okay, so just, uh, I'm going to do, we, we've looked at a variety of paths that have contributed to land loss. As Dania and Bryce referenced, we have extra legal, um, Causes in terms of violence and intimidation, including lynching, um, just literally running people out of town. I'm going to focus on some private property laws that have been a source of substantial black loss, both in terms of urban and rural properties. So the five just in the slide is, is foreclosure, adverse possession, tax sales, partition sales, an eminent domain. I know there's a lot of people in the audience who are not legally trained. Um, I can't quite do a property 101 for you, but you can catch up with me later. Um, one of the points I want to make about these is some of these are seen as neutral processes, tax sales. So the idea, if you think about it that way, if you don't pay your property taxes, the government could take a lien on that and then foreclose on that lien. So there, it could be framed as, well, you were just not either able or responsible enough to pay your property taxes. But a number of these various processes, as we've seen from the Bruce's Beach case, have been highly racialized. 
And I just tried to put some notes, for example, with tax sales. Um, although up until a few years ago, there were almost no scholars studying this, it's been kind of revealed in the last few years, that there's often been discriminatory tax assessments which have resulted in making black property owners far more vulnerable when you already have kind of a wealth gap. Those families have difficulty, and it just takes uh, an illness, a discriminatory tax assessment, maybe to push them over. The same thing with foreclosure. We talked about the uh, Pickford cases this morning. So yes, the end result was black farmers didn't have the money to pay their monthly mortgage payments. But behind that was the, uh, a bunch of actors, including uh, the government, the USDA, and some private actors, who were who denied people the opportunity to, uh, to have loans and denied them participation in other programs. I'm just wondering, since I'm walking around, should I take this off, I guess? Um, so anyway, that, it, it basically softened up these black farmers and made them vulnerable. Okay, so just in terms of, just make sure that that's it. Um, so one of these examples I look at so is is uh, is eminent domain, and I'm like thrilled about the Bruce's Beach case for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons I'm thrilled is I started talking, I don't know, about ten years ago, um, and making the point that the way we teach eminent domain in property in first year property in law school paints a completely incorrect picture of who have been the primary victims of eminent domain. So the primary victims of eminent domain are not uh, just black and brown people disproportionately. They've actually numerically been in the majority of the people who have been the victims of kind of eminent domain. So there's some of, I see a few of my property students uh, in this classroom, give yourselves a, uh, uh, you know, raise the roof. Um, <laughs> But the, we're going to, so we haven't gotten to this yet, class, but uh, the, the major case in most textbooks, 1L property textbooks, is Kilo versus City of New London. It's also, it was uh, taken on by the Institute for Justice. They've, you know, done a lot of branding, marketing. There's been, uh, you know, um, movies made about it. So it's known as like the little pink house, right? So Suzette Kilo owns this little pink house or owned it. In the city of New London, the city of New London was one of the chronically distressed communities in Connecticut, like forever. And they were trying to do economic development. And, and the, that case was about, could you have economic development, right, for, for private economic development, right? Um, and this, is, this case has become viewed as the paradigmatic case of eminent domain abuse. And so I wanted to, like, you know, so I always usually say that with respect to Kilo, I'm agnostic about whether it's eminent domain abuse. I think you can tell from my tone, maybe I'm not as agnostic as I'm, I'm making myself seem. But I see, but my point is, okay, so Kilo involved nine properties, all white owned, and Suzette Kilo was paid almost three times the market value for her property. For the non-lawyers in the room in an eminent domain case, what you're entitled to is under the U.S. Constitution, just compensation which has been interpreted to mean the fair market value of property, not three times the fair market value of property. This home wasn't historic. It didn't, you know, I mean, it was pink. But the, <laughs> so, my, so what I've said is, if, if this is eminent domain abuse, then what black and brown people have suffered is eminent domain abuse on steroids. So just a couple of, I was interviewed by NPR, A. Martinez, a couple of years ago, and I didn't know this until he told me where Dodger Stadium, I know we got some folks from California, I know it's the right part of California, San Francisco, I'm sorry, George. Um, the, um, but where Dodger Stadium is in Chavez regime, Ravine. What I didn't know was that Chavez Ravine, before it became Dodger Stadium, was home to 300 Mexican-American homeowners that were, uh, their properties were condemned. Initially, they said they were gonna build a low-income housing um, uh, community, but actually the property was given to uh, to the owner of the Dodgers. They were many of them were forcibly removed, and they were paid little compensation, let alone anything approaching fair market. A couple of years after Kilo, we had this case in New Orleans, Mid City uh, neighborhood. 
This was an area just south of downtown in, in LA. Many of these homes actually had been rebuilt after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and these were homes that many of the famous jazz and blues artists had lived in. So these, these were historic homes, about 250 of them. And then Louisiana used eminent domain to build a couple new hospitals that it claimed it needed. None, 80% of the property owners were African American. None of them received fair market value or anything approaching fair market value. So my choice, I always ask, like, if, if Kilo is so much, why aren't these cases in our property textbooks? Because these are eminent domain on steroids. Okay, so in terms of this substantial amount of property loss, we've both been talking in the earlier panels at lunch. One of the points I, I want to make is that, yes, it's had a massive economic negative impact, right? Trillions of dollars in wealth lost. I mean, we're just talking about the black farmers between 1908 and 1997, and that's $326 billion. Just imagine all the properties that are implicated. It stifled business and economic development in black and brown communities, and it's had negative collateral effects on other uh, uh, black and brown people. But I want to also emphasize that it's not just the economic, it's the non-economic. It's the eraser of history and culture, sometimes cultural appropriation, let me put a pin on that, and negative health and well-being effects. It, Willa Bruce died within five years of the property being taken. She actually had an emotional breakdown, and then her husband died a year later. So that's just a, an example that you can multiply and generalize. The cultural appropriation, so, so the, some of the history, I was familiar with this neighborhood, uh, this community in South Carolina called the Phillips community. These were these landowners that got land. Um, soon after the end of the Civil War, one of the, it was a plantation where one of the signatories to the Declaration of Independence had owned that. So this is incredibly historic property, but families started losing of their land through partition sales. Um, no consideration that, the, that that property had just incredible historic value. I kind of got my start down this road in terms of the work I'm doing today. I'm from San Francisco. I grew I was born in 65, my students can do the math. Um, and I remember that my father was, some people say, I don't know if this is true, that he was the first black ophthalmologist in San Francisco. His, office building was on the border between Pacific Heights, which is, if anybody knows San Francisco, one of the wealthiest communities uh, in the city, and what we used to call the Fillmore, which was uh, a substantial number of mostly working class black families and a number of black businesses. When I grew up, the Fillmore, sometimes we called it the Western Edition, was subject to urban renewal. So anytime you heard anything in the media about the Fillmore, which, which, what you quickly heard about was pimps, prostitutes, drug dealers, violence. There was never anything positive said about the Fillmore to justify the urban renewal project. I was home a few years ago. Uh, I mean, my mother still lives there. My older sister's in the Bay. And I was asked to give a talk at the University of San Francisco about the Fillmore. So I got in a couple days early. I figured, like, you know, my rent a car. Let me just drive up and down the Fillmore. And what do I see? I see these, flat, these um, uh, banners that the city has been hanging, uh, claiming that the Fillmore was the historic jazz district. I didn't know that history. And then I found out that in the 1940s and 50s, there were more jazz clubs in the Fillmore than anywhere else in the United States west of Harlem. And so it's interesting when they were justifying yeah. condemning these properties, they were, rent, they were considered deviant. Now that they've displaced all the black people, now the city of San Francisco is marketing to tourists, come spend time in the historic jazz district. So well, as, as many people here know, one of my focuses has been on so-called heirs property. This is family-owned property that's passed from one gener generation to the next without, usually, uh, without a will or a state plan. Um, so there's a, a number of kind of negative impacts. Um, if you own heirs property, it's susceptible to land loss, and uh, there's uh, ownership structures that 
enable, don't enable to use it for an optimal use or management. And then you're often, because you lack clear title to the property, you are rendered ineligible to use your property as collateral for loans that you could maybe send your children and their educational expenses or other ways that you could be building wealth. And it's it contributed to the, uh, to the racial wealth gap. There are a variety of forms of problems with heirs' property. The th statutes that I have I'm most known for falls into that first bucket of the property is inherently insecure as a result of a legal action called a partition action. But there are these other problems. Once you fall into heirs property under the current law, if you then realize that this is about the worst form of common real property ownership in terms of the legal structure, it takes 100% of the members of the ownership group to de decide oh, I could change this into a trust or an LLC or what's called a tenancy in common agreement. And then we have this problem of lacking clear title and tangled title. Uh, we have the Philadelphia Register of Wills in our room, so uh, she's completely familiar with the problem with tangled title. Um, and then there's also, for most heirs property owners in, in pretty much every jurisdiction except for Texas now, if you are an heirs property owner who uses the property as your primary residence, you are boxed out from being able to claim the homestead exemption, which could make your property taxes substantially higher than they otherwise would be. One of the problems that makes heirs, so there's a number of kind of risk factors uh, that uh, make those who own heirs property very susceptible to losing that property. You, we talk about these property owners as being property rich and cash poor because of the racial wealth gap. They tend to lack access to affordable legal services. They have very low rates of will making. And the, the property owners who are most susceptible are property owners who initially when they got the property, because they were black and brown, it was not considered prime real estate, but it is now considered a property that has a substantial potential. Just in terms of the estate planning gap, no surprise for every racial and ethnic group, those who have the least education make estate plans or wills at the lowest rate, those who make it at the highest rate are those who have the most education. But I just want to let you, I don't know if this has a pointer, yeah. So for African Americans, it's true that African Americans with a college degree have a will making rate of 32%, which is the highest for among African Americans. But then for white Americans, those with the, what the heck? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Those with the lowest education in this particular study were those who didn't have a high school degree. So in other words, white Americans under the study without a high school degree made wills at 25% a higher rate than the highest education, educated African Americans. So, e, so as a result of this, and you look at that first problem of all these African American, numerous African American families losing land as a result of a partition sale. We're talking about an ownership structure where it's a group of people who own property together. They own fractional interests, so nobody owns the entire property. Under the partition law, any one of the co tenants could file what they call a partition action and request a forced sale of the entire property, even if everybody else wants to maintain ownership. Real estate speculators starting decades ago learned about partition law and they ended up, you know, they would typically buy out the most distant relative, let's say the relative who's living on the south or west side of Chicago, who's the third cousin um, in the third generation, didn't even know that they had this 2% interest in this property back in Mississippi. And then they would file this action that resulted in the property being sold. So Hilton Head Island, for example, is a great example. Before 1950, Hilton Head was remote. There was not an easy way to access it. South Carolina built a bridge. Real estate developers get this vision of how great Hilton Head could be. And basically, it's the Hilton Head of today. But they use partition actions to dispossess many African-American families. So part of my legislative work is I ended up being the principal drafter of what's called a uniform act when I talk to normal people, I shouldn't say it that way, non-legal people. Um, I describe it as a model state statute um, and it's promulgate, promulgated by an organization called the Uniform Law Commission set up in 1892 by the American Bar Association. It's the, it's the organization in the United States that has produced more 
model state statutes than any other. They're at like 450 for even a lot of lawyers are not familiar. So what, but when I say to lawyers or law students, do you, have you ever heard of the Uniform Commercial Code? Um, they're like, everybody nods. I'm like, where do you think that came from? Um, the Uniform Law Commission. So we have, there's three parts of the statute, so I want to kind of move into solutions, um, that are designed to strengthen the property rights of disadvantaged heirs property owners so they don't get divested of their property or their generational wealth. The first thing is if somebody tries to start this partition action and requests for sale, the other common owners then have the right to buy out the fractional interest of the person asking for the sale, and they're treated very well economically in terms of their buyout. You know, they do an appraisal of the land. If they have a 5% of the, say the land's worth $500,000, they have a 5% interest, then they're entitled to $25,000. That, um, so that's one provision. Second provision is the law on its surface in all these states had said that if the, we're talking about a rural land, that the preferred remedy was to physically divide it and allocate some of the parcels to uh, the various co-tenants. But common law judges, state court judges, undermined that by coming up with a test that effectively made the forced sale the preferred. Under the second part of our statute, we say we agree with the state statutes, even though they weren't well elaborated, and we come up with a, a test we call the totality of the circumstances test, where a court has to take into account economic and non-economic uh, considerations, including longstanding ownership in the family. What would be the impact if somebody was dispossessed of their property, for example? Would it result in a sub substantial reduction of the quality of their housing, maybe even render them homeless? And the court now has to make findings on all of that. And the third part was that these, these, um, the former law and the, under the former law, state court judges were justifying these sales, saying that they were wealth maximizing, that selling the property was going to be more valuable to the family than retaining the part of the land under this theory that land sometimes has or property has economies of scale, which was farcical in that the the properties weren't sold under conditions designed to produce a market value price. They were designed to produce what we call a for sale price, sometimes a fire sale. So we kind of agreed with the goal of wealth maximization where the property has to be sold. But we put in place a new sales procedure. We call it the open market sales procedure that's designed to mimic a sale between a willing seller and a willing buyer. I actually got the idea from Scotland. Um, just fun fact. So here's where we are with the act. So when I started, I had a publication in 2001 in the Northwestern University Law Review. I kind of tried to elaborate what the nature of the problem was, its various manifestations, its negative impacts, and then I proposed four or five reform proposals. At that time, uh, the universal reaction among law professors and lawyers was I was wasting my time. And then the, the idea was that the people I cared about fundamentally lacked political and economic power and that what folks were telling me is that what you have identified, it's not a bug, it's a feature of a system where those who are powerful take advantage of those who are less powerful. They did have some empirical data. There were a number of southern states beginning in the early 70s that tried to reform this partition law, and they all met the graveyard. Um, fast forward today. Can you click on to the status of the... So where are we today with this act? So today, you might have to scroll down a little bit to get through. So today, we're sitting on 22 enactments in 20 states, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia most recently, this summer. The state of Washington legislature just unanimously approved on Tuesday. I got um, that note. The governor is going to sign it in the state of Washington in 10 days. And we have four other states this legislative session, including Massachusetts, where we have our bill introduced. Can you get rid of the screen? All right, so, you know, fun fact, this is some of the, some of the areas like, so this is Virginia. Uh, a couple years ago, they enacted it. I, the governor invited me. I very much wanted to go because I wanted to balance out this picture, you know, <laughs> not, not ideological, I wanted to, you know, but it was the height of COVID, there was no vaccine. My wife told me absolutely not, so <laughs> didn't get to go there. Um, one of the successes of the act, though, so the Uniform Law Commission thought this was going to be a loser. Uh, there were three attempts in the three years we drafted it between 2010 and 2007 and 10. For 
for them to kill the project in the committee because they thought this is going to have the same result as it had in the southern states. Um, at, at the number of enactments we have today, the Uniform Partition of Bears Property Act is the most successful uniform real property act the Uniform Law Commission has promulgated in the last 30 years. So what happened about five years ago? I got a call. They're like, hey, Thomas, you got any ideas for another act? Um, I said, well, it's funny you should ask. I do. So I mentioned, I'm not going to get into detail, I mentioned that another problem with heirs property owners is gridlocked ownership where you need unanimous uh, approval to either change the ownership structure or do anything substantial with the property. This act that's going to be finalized in the next six weeks is, is addressing that problem. Okay, so just wanted to uh, kind of go over some other great developments. So, you know, when sometimes people ask me, well, how are you doing? I mean, I, there was a question this morning about, do you get depressed? I say, you know, yeah, I'm not, you know, I read the newspaper. Um, there's a lot of things going on in our society that are not uplifting to the soul. But then I, I remember the work I've done. Like when I started, folks said nothing can be done. It's just the way it is. It's the way it's been for decades. It's the way it's going to be forever. Don't waste your time. So now we have this successful you know, legislation, and then there's been knock-on legislation. There's been this uh, statute in Texas that addresses this homestead exemption. Hawaii, when they enacted it into law, they built upon it, and they realized these families didn't have good legal services. So now in a partition action in Hawaii inver that involves native Hawaiian land, you have to make the um, Hawaii uh, Office of Hawaiian Affairs a party so that you basically have a built-in lawyer. Virginia did, after they passed it into law, the, in the next year or two, they passed another heirs' property to help heirs' property owners in tax sales. There's been appropriations. The 2018 Farm Bill um, specifically mentions the U Uniform Partition of Heirs' Property Act, and it gives states an incentive. But more importantly, they also give money to, so families could change their ownership structure, get an estate plan. And then, as I indicated, we have our, my, my new friends from Philly here. The, you know, so you can, the, 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 city was at the, Philly, the city council approved this $7.5 million to help clear tangled titles. DC, when they approved it this summer, Mayor Bowser, she didn't know about heirs' property. She got educated. Not only did she support it, she gave, she put in her budget a million dollars for legal aid providers to help heirs' property owners. You've had a number of law schools now work in the space, some of them HBCUs, Thurgood Marshall, my uh, law school, Howard University. They're talking about establishing a new clinic in the next couple of years to deal with heirs' property, tangled title, and estate planning. Um, and guess what we're going to do here at Boston College Law School, if I can get some resources. Anybody in the room has got some friends with resources. Uh, but, um, and then there's been these other kind of good developments. Um, once again, in Philly, they've been working really interesting work where they uh, worked with, I think it was the Pew Foundation and UPenn, and this fascinating study where they mapped heirs' property and tangled title where there was extreme gun violence in Philly and showing that they, there was a convergence. Um, and they've been doing incredible work in Philadelphia that serves as a, can serve as a model. San Antonio has been doing some great work. And then you have a variety of other organizations, uh, some public interest, some um, uh, university-based that have been working on heirs' property. There's somebody here from the National Consumer Law Center, or two people, yes. I think they're graduates of our yes. law school, and I just got an email that they have decided to make heirs' property a priority. Uh, fantastic development. So, I'm sorry, Melvin, how much did I go over? I'm sure I went over. Apologize. So, let me uh, turn it over to the next person. Okay, I'm gonna talk about Contempor a brief, brief history of USDA and uh, contemporary, mostly contemporary problems. So as you've heard, uh, most black farmers call USDA the last plantation. And this is actually a picture on Wikipedia of the USDA headquarters with somebody plowing the field in front of it. Um, okay, this is Lloyd Wright, who was civil rights director under Bill Clinton. He's, and he's a farmer too. He says it doesn't matter who's running the damn plantation very much because because it doesn't change very much. And I think you'll you'll understand why he's saying that when I go through the presentation. Um, the modern USDA took shape under the New Deal. 
government involvement, you know, was stepped up in a major way. Um, repeating myself, but government payments went from 3 to 31 percent of farm income from 1929 to 1940. And Southern Democrats ensured that this, you know, they were part of the, the Democratic bloc. The Democrats needed them to pass legislation. So they ensured that the new money would be distributed under local control, by which they meant under white control, so that black people would not have access to it. And part of what this did was it set up these local offices that would be staffed by white Southerners. And while the staff in the D.C. headquarters was more liberal, out in the field they were very conservative and very overtly racist at this time. And this dynamic of uh, the, the money being sent out of D.C., the more liberal people in D.C. being separated from the field offices where most of the discrimination is happening, uh, it's at the core of the problems at USDA today. In other words, that the more liberal people at headquarters are not exerting control over the people in the field offices when they're discriminating. Okay, so the Kennedy administration appointed William Sebron as the first civil rights director, and he drew up a very aggressive plan um, of civil rights enforcement at the department, but he was never really given authority. And part of why he was, a big part of why he was stopped um, was because of Representative Jamie Witten and others like him. Jamie Witten, who's pictured in the top right, was a plantation owner and a representative from Mississippi. And he was known as the permanent secretary of agriculture because he was on an appropriations committee and he could move money into and out of programs he liked and didn't like, and that gave him a huge amount of sway over the department. And he was adamantly opposed to civil rights enforcement. Lyndon Bain, uh, you know, LBJ's ag secretary said, I have two bosses. One is President Johnson, the other is Jamie Witten. Under Earl Butts, who was Richard Nixon's ag secretary, 80% of the civil rights staff was moved to unrelated work, which basically killed the office. And then Reagan's civil rights director actually said that civil rights enforcement is not a good return on investment for the Republican Party, so they weren't going to do it anymore. And civil rights investigations fell from 90 to, to zero. And Jamie Witten is in the top right, Earl Butts the bottom left, and then this is the woman is June uh, Kalajavari, who was a civil rights lawyer who represented USDA employees. If you want to read more of the history, it's in an article I co-authored in Mother Jones. Okay, so when the when Tom Vilsack, uh, who's on the left, came in under President Obama, he within months he said that there was already a new era for civil rights at the department. And he repeated this idea in this, an exit essay he wrote in 2016. And he claimed various major accomplishments at USDA. And he also said there had been an increase in black farmers, which he implied was due to his department's efforts. All of these claims, all of the major claims he made are misleading or false. And the gentleman on the right is Joe Leonard, who is his civil rights director. Nathan Rosenberg of Harvard and I co-authored an investigative report on Vilsack's administration in 2019. We spent two or three years on this article. He interviewed over 150 people. We had thousands of pages of FOIA documents and data. And we went to four southern states to meet with black farmers. And we also interviewed Tom Vilsack and Joe Leonard multiple times. So I can only go through a few of the claims, but you can find the article in the counter. Um, Vilsack claimed he had resolved thousands of cases that hadn't been reviewed under the Bush administration. But we found the statute of limitations had run out for all of these cases, so nobody received restitution. So they weren't really resolved. And this is something he, he repeated when he came back under, under Biden recently. We, the Vilsack claimed that his department 
decrease the funding gap between black and white farmers, but we found through a FOIA request that they sent a smaller share of loans to black farmers than the Bush administration had. And both administrations sent less than 1% of loans to black farmers. And then in another claim they made was that discrimination complaints fell under Tom Vilsack. But there's two problems with this. One is that USDA does not have reliable records of discrimination complaints, which they themselves admitted in a report that once again we got through FOIA. And since there are no reliable numbers, it's impossible to say if they've gone down or gone up. In spite of that, the data that we did get, again, through FOIA, actually showed an increase from Bush to Obama. So a, ma a major claim that Vilsack made was that the number of black farmers increased. And he said this a lot, and Joe Leonard said it a lot, and it was repeated a lot in the news. But we investigated this idea from several angles, and I believe we present overwhelming evidence that this is not true. This graph, the red line, you, what, you, what, you, what you have to know is that USDA introduced changes to the Census of Agriculture starting in 1997, and they put in new changes each year. And these changes made the census more accurate, but it had used to miss black farmers. So now it was counting more black farmers, so it looked like there was an increase. But the new numbers are not comparable to the earlier numbers. And USDA has said that when talking about women farmers, for example. So you can't compare the green line to the red line, which is what they were doing. And if you look at the red line, you see it didn't change all that much. But USDA also made an effort to reach out to black farmers more in more recent years. And this could be what, and probably is why the red line goes up. And so another thing we did is we asked black farmers, do you think there are more black farmers? And everybody said no. Um, and kind of a humorous exchange we had was with Haywood Harrell, who's a farmer in Halifax County in North Carolina that Thomas was talking about earlier, the county. And we asked him what he thought the correct figures for black farmers were in 2007 and 2012. And he said maybe 25, then maybe 12. We told him the census reported 51 and 68. Dumbfounded, he asked us to repeat USDA's estimates, and then he laughed. Glad to know I got some more folk out here I don't know. And this is another look at the census. You see before 97 there was a clear decline, and all of a sudden when USDA started making changes, the number went up. And you see this for white farmers, women farmers, all farmers. So it's clear that it was changes in the census that caused the increase. Okay, you've, you've, you've heard about Pigford. I'll just quickly reiterate that most claimants only got 50,000. Many others were denied. And the New York Times published this story that alleged widespread fraud, and Pigford got a really bad reputation in the press because of that. And this hurt black farmers because white people in their neighborhood thought they had been paid off because that's what the right-wing press was saying, and it seemed to be validated by the New York Times. So. Um, you're probably not surprised to hear it didn't get better under Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> the Trump, Trump administration appointed a, a high-ranking lawyer from the department's legal defense office to enforce civil rights. The legal defense office is supposed to defend the department. The civil rights office is supposed to guarantee the rights of people with discrimination complaints against the department. And so that's why there is federal law that mandates a firewall between these two offices. But the Trump appointment merely made explicit an overlap that has been going on since at least the 2000s. In other words, the legal defense office has been meddling in the affairs of the civil rights office since at least the late 2000s. And we asked 19 employees about this, and they all said the legal defense office told the civil rights office what to do. And that includes two former directors of the Civil Rights Office, Lloyd Wright and Joe Leonard. And so this quote here, the Civil Rights employee says, it's like working for Coca-Cola. They, they, as in the, civil, the Legal Defense Office, are in the business of defending the agency, and they're not trying to pay anyone. 
Even if someone has a compelling case, it goes to OGC, which is the defense office. And OGC figures out a way to draft something up that basically denies or closes the complaint. The OGC kept a position that none of the complaints should be paid, said Lloyd Wright. They were worse than the civil rights people. It's the civil rights leadership, which I don't have time to talk about at the moment. Uh, also, we heard, finds any reason to not qualify a case. So the dysfunction in D.C. doesn't just hurt black farmers. It hurts other farmers with discrimination complaints, rural housing clients, women in the Forest Service who report sexual harassment, and employees in D.C. Who, where there's also a big harassment problem. All of these people are denied their rights. And we found in an investigation for Mother Jones that two, the two sources told us that USDA set up an email where people could send complaints about programs like SNAP or the food stamps program, and that this email went unmonitored under Donald Trump's administration. And we got email records that showed there were 40,000 unread emails at the end of fiscal year 2017. Then when the staff became aware of the problem, there were suddenly 110, 111,000 read emails. And I have one of the emails in the top right, and, and we got hundreds of emails like this. She said, I'm an elderly, disabled, widowed woman. I suffer from illnesses including dementia, osteoporosis, hypertension, diabetes, and depression. My SNAP benefit is my only source of providing food and nutrition. And these emails were just being sent into a void until someone finally looked at them. So the Trump administration also carried out a bailout program uh, just connected to its trade war with China. And we obtained data through FOIA, yet again, that showed that 99% of the bailout went to white farmers. And there was a related program called, well, there was another program at the same time called CFAP, and it was a similar story. The, Trade bailouts, and this is Trump's ag secretary, the trade bailouts were tied to production so that the, the biggest farms got the most money. There's fewer than 500 black family-owned commercial farms, whereas there's almost 300,000 white ones. And because, because black farmers have been denied the opportunity to have commercial farms, they weren't really eligible for this program, even if there hadn't been discrimination in the way the, the money was dispersed. So this is another way that the past discrimination compounds in the present. And we've heard, we haven't had time to investigate the Biden administration yet, but we have heard complaints. Um, there was a lot of unhappiness about Tom Vilsack coming back. And you know, I've heard that a lot of farmers are unhappy with the slowness with which the debt relief is being distributed now, and that the Equity Commission, which is investigating civil rights at USDA, is just rehashing old promises that Tom Vilsack himself made when he first came to USDA. So for solutions, um, there's the Justice for Black Farmers Act, which Senator Cory Booker introduced, and it has many good provisions such as an independent body to oversee civil rights at USDA, relief of Pigford debt. Reparations are important. Black farmers had land stolen from them and they had their opportunities closed off. This happened to black people as a group and so they should be compensated so they can be represented in the farm economy. It needs to be easier to be a farmer. The land, the equipment, the inputs are too expensive for all but the rich if you want to engage in commercial agriculture. Land needs to be cheaper. And a lot of land was obtained illegally and unfairly. And we should be talking about how to redistribute it. And a final point is that farm workers put in most of the hours on US farms and they receive little pay. They need to have their rights. And there's actually more black farm workers than there are black farmers. And so again, if you want to get in touch with me, just send me an email. Okay. In any event, let, let, let's dive right in. And um, 
I, I did want to create a little bit of space. I'm, I, won't, I won't take up too much time as either in terms of this roundtable discussion. Uh, I'll just pose a couple of questions and, and then I'll transition so we can open it up to the Q&A component. But I did want to create just a little bit of space uh, for uh, uh, some thoughts, some reflections on um, a reparative framework. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, just by virtue of the, 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 the title of our, of our conference, where we're sort of looking at this question of the nexus, land loss, reparations, and housing policy, as we've, as we've heard, there, there have been a number of policies and practices, right, that have uh, been effectuated over time and that continue to operate uh, in the present uh, to the detriment of the ability of African Americans to have access to property and, and wealth. And uh, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more from all of your efforts uh, since they sort of have this uh, legal, com legal components. What are you seeing as the different types of barriers, hurdles, uh, or obstacles uh, in your thinking about uh, a framework for, for reparative justice? And, I, and I'm happy to add just, just one other remark here. Uh, but if there's some initial thoughts on that, on that, com on that sort of um, on, on that sort of perspective, I, I'd love to hear them. Um. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so in terms of what are the barriers, you know, there's two, there's two that I'm focused on. Um, you know, one barrier I think is around, uh, I'll call it a, a narrative barrier. Um, and then I think there's, there's actually real legal barriers, and I'll give some examples there. Let's start with the narrative barrier. Um, you know, this, uh, this important conversation that we're all having about restitution and reparations is one that, um, you know, has been and continues to be fairly polarizing in our society. And you've got, um, you know, you've got real opposition from some folks and a narrative that I, that I hear and when I try to engage in conversation and constructive dialogue around this, a, a narrative that I frequently hear is the, um, you know, that wasn't you, that wasn't me narrative, right? In other words, this happened a long time in the past. It didn't happen to you. It might have happened to you know, people in your family 100 years ago, but it didn't happen to you. And I didn't do that. Um, and so, um, and, and I, think, I think we need to approach that, uh, you know, that thought and that conversation, that dialogue a little more constructively. Um, it's clear to me, and I think from looking at the data, it's clear that practices and policies and decisions that were made 100 years ago, 60 years ago, 30 years ago, have a direct line effect as to where we find ourselves now. And, and from my own work, I'll give a, a basic example. I talked earlier about the imminent domain action and how the city of Manhattan Beach kind of intentionally drew the box big enough to pick up every um, uh, uh, home that was owned by a black family. Today, in the 33 cities in the county of Los Angeles, city of Manhattan Beach has the lowest black ownership of any city. It's 0.7%. That's not a random coincidence, right? You can draw a straight line between the actions that the city took in the 1920s to where we are today. So, so the first challenge we have is we've got to get around this narrative. And, and what's critical there is this idea of, well, look, it's just, you know, some folks don't want it as badly. Right, or some folks have different you know, priorities or different, like, no, that's not true. Like, we own massive amounts of property. We were building businesses, and we were robbed through government action and private action. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is, are, you know, are the legal challenges. Um, you know, I mentioned that we spent the first four months on the Bruce's Beach work looking for affirmative kind of litigation that we could bring to compel the government to return that property. And... Um, and there were no, right, there were no clear paths there, right? And you've got legal concepts like statute of limitations, which means too much time has gone past and, and it's already been decided. You've got these, uh, these different legal concepts. I'll, I'll give another just example to make it real. One of our biggest concerns in the case was how the return of the property to the Bruce's would be treated for tax purposes. Um, we wanted to make sure they got this land back that, you know, I was saying was worth 20 million and I didn't want the family to get a tax bill for $8 million. And I remember at one point with the county, I said, look, if you return the land without addressing this, my clients will be in jail by the end of the year because they can't pay their taxes. Um, I, 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 we did a lot of legal research on this to try to figure out could we take a position that 
that the land, it's a return of property, return of lost property, it's not taxable. Um, and like we could not find strong authority. What I did find was that Congress in the 1980s passed a law that applies to Nazi looted art and Nazi looted property. So if you're a Jewish family and you lost property, the Nazis in the, in the 40s, um, and that you know, painting was returned 30 years later and it's a $25 million Monet, Congress has said that's not taxable, we're not gonna tax you. But they haven't done it for, for black folks and, and, and property. So um, those are some of the barriers we need to address. We need to get this narrative right because that's gonna create the space for the political will and leadership we need to fix the legislative and legal barriers. Yeah, so I would say that if you kind of look at and do a broad sweep in U.S. history, what we have seen is periods of black advancement are soon followed by periods of white backlash. We talked about black farmers and the high water mark of black land ownership, followed by substantial extra legal and legal and other backlash. In the 60s and 70s after the Civil Rights Movement, black folks experienced advancement as Denia at Harvard last night detailed with some statistics. In the 80s, we got welfare queens and a whole narrative that was backlash. President Obama gets elected. We're living in this race-neutral society, but then there's backlash because we're not. Um, so I, I think, you know, in terms of the uh, $5 billion black farmers were supposed to get early on in the Biden administration that was directly tied to documented historical evidence, that was a narrowly tailored remedy, should have passed constitutional muster, and then there was backlash with a number of white farming organizations that, who have filed suit and they've held up that payment in the court. So I think you just got to be prepared that there's going to be backlash. Um, and, you know, you've got to do whatever you can to take that into account. Already George has talked about a number of kind of legal issues. Let me just talk about something a little bit different. So, so sometimes in my work, what I saw was a gap was between uh, scholars and some others calling for, you know, uh, robust and fulsome reparations, but not then paying attention to for black and brown folks who had some assets. Maybe they weren't, you know, uh, you know, mansions, but they had some property, and there wasn't enough focused on asset preservation. Um, in my work on trying to reform um, the laws on partition with this heirs' property. There had been almost no kind of serious thinking about legal reform and policies. There was a lot of um, grassroots organizations, legal aid, community-based organizations that were trying to fight the good fight with almost no resources on individual cases one at a time, but not thinking about it at a more structural kind of level. And I remember talking to some folks, and there was kind of this narrative that, well, you know, if we lose the property, we'll just increase the reparations bill. Like, and I was like, how many times in the United States history has the federal government forked over trillions of dollars? Like, I mean, just to put all your eggs in that basket without then having a diversified portfolio of both asset preservation and claims for redress seemed very short-sighted to me. Even if there were substantial reparations, we're going to have the asset preservation problem. And I'll just end on this note. Um, you, you, you have some analogies sometimes from U.S. history in terms of uh, our indigenous people, Native Americans, when they've had assets. Um, one is kind of not a great example. It was the Dawes Act of 1887. Basically, the federal government took millions of acres of land from Native Americans, declared it a surplus land, and sold it to white folks. But under the Dawes Act, Native Americans got individual plots of, you know, um, like 80 to 120 acres or something like that. Those individual titles, 80% of them were lost within a decade, within a generation, because there weren't asset preservations. There wasn't the financial literacy. There wasn't the access to legal services to structure that ownership. 
Um, same thing in, 19, uh, uh, in the mid-1940s, Congress created something called the Indian Claims Commission. It had a little bit of a cynical purpose, was right, was that all the Native Americans were mad that the U.S. had broken all these treaties and a lot of it was folk kind of saying on their land. And the idea is if we can pay them, we can then say in the future, well, we dealt with that issue. But there were, I think, $600 million was transferred to various tribes under um, the Indian Claims Commission payouts, and a lot of that money got dissipated. So that's something just to kind of think about. I mean, it's hard enough to get, you know, reparations, but to think that that's going to be this, like, complete victory without thinking about asset preservation. So that both plays into maintaining the asset, so you don't add it to the reparations bill, but even if we had reparations, thinking seriously about is that transfer of... Uh, of, of assets and money, is that a Pyrrhic victory or is that going to be sustaining? And uh, briefly, at USDA, um, Nate, Nate and I have I interviewed, uh, again, Nate Rosenberg, my co author, have interviewed a, a lot of people who work at USDA, and we've heard uh, extremely serious allegations of, of wrongdoing at the department, including criminal activity and We've talked with people in Congress, and they are interested in acting, but I just feel they, they don't want to really look into how bad. It's almost hard to believe how corrupt the Civil Rights Office is, and I think people are afraid to really look at it. So I think, uh, you know, if, if, if it's, uh, I, think our, I think our FOIA requests, our interviews, and then putting it, putting it into a report has, has been helpful and anybody can FOIA USDA and you know if anybody does that and they want me and Nate to write it up where we try to be a conduit for people working in this cause because it does get a little discouraging telling people in Congress about this but then seeing nothing happen. Okay so we're um, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm I'm tempted to take moderator's advantage or, or privilege, as it were, but I think in the interest of time, we definitely want to make sure that the audience has some participation. Uh, so if we could uh, have some uh, assistance, we, we've got uh, folks with the microphones that are ready and raring to go. Uh, I'm going to have you come down to this gentleman uh, here in the front. And Oh, did you already have somebody ready to go? And just as we, just as we, um, just as we move into this, you know, in the interest of time, and I'll, I'll try and check my panelists as well to, uh, uh, to, be, to be brief. So we'll, we'll start here first, and then we'll go immediately there. Okay, thank you. My name is Ben Time, and I'm an attorney here in Boston. I'm here with a colleague, Juliana Michigan. Um, thank you for all the work that you're doing, first of all, each of you on the panel and everybody else that's spoken. My question is um, what the state of the research is um, with respect to identifying uh, current owners of wrongfully taken black property, especially other municipal or governmental owners like L.A. County or corporations or institutions? So I think that George uh, referred to this organization in Southern California. Is it Cave on Ward? Right. Yeah. Um, where is my land? So this Where is My Land organization. Um, I'm scheduled actually to talk to her in the next couple weeks. So I think they're trying to more systematically um, accumulate and document uh, where they can, right? George mentioned that he gets one email a day or voicemail. I get maybe one every three days. So we were just talking about, uh, you know, when, when people have seen me in the media, they assume that they hear Professor Mitchell, but they think it's Attorney Mitchell, and even though they talks about my legislative reform, they think that I run a legal aid, I have an army of attorneys, I don't. So I, you know, so I am not actually in the position to deliver legal services, or I don't have a national referral list, but I've, I've maintained those emails, um, trying, and I'm thinking like maybe there's somebody, organization like Where's My Land that I could, you know, um, or maybe we can do research, because a lot of these, these cases are a little different. Sometimes it involves oil and gas leases. Sometimes um, it's beachfront property. Sometimes it's farmland. Uh, sometimes it's a single family home. So, um, but I don't know of any thing that's more systematized than that. 
Yeah, I, don't, I, I love the question, and I think that's an important step to take, but I don't know of any, uh, any efforts to do that. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mavis Gregg, and I want to thank you for all you do. And Thomas, great conference. Uh, I'm a death and dirt attorney focusing on heirs' property and particularly working with families with rural ag land. Uh, I was invited by the OGC to present on heirs' property to their attorneys and had lots of questions from their attorneys about what should we do, what can we do. <laughs> And I didn't have an answer because where do we start? So I'm just curious if the panelists have any recommendations for what um, attorneys at the USDA can or should do um, to improve the, the work that the USDA does as it relates to landowners. <laughs> you heard that? I mean, you know, so um, I'm just having, because I, I like to speak when I have full information, right? Um, and I know that, as I, I know how serious Nate and Bright are, and I know the extent of the number of people they've talked to, right? So there's clearly a massive problem. Um, you know, at the same time, since the 2018 Farm Bill, there has been some, at least at the congressional level, and um, there have been USDA programs that have been um, authorized. There's been, a, um, there's been money um, given for these programs. Um, and then there was a lot of delay under the Trump administration. Um, when I say a lot of delay, they didn't do anything, right? But under the Biden administration, some of those programs now have been stood up, right? Um, it's too early to tell, like, how effectively they're operating and are they helping in, in terms of the relending program, um, you know, how many folks are taking advantage of that, right? So um, there's also been, I think, um, helpful, at least in terms of the uh, USDA policies and on terms of like conservation easements and some of the conservation matters to make it easier for heirs property owners to be able to, to get those benefits, right? So, you know, um, you know, at least those are positive developments, but I'm not, I don't have the type of, uh, the magnitude of the interactions with emails or the, um, so all I know is it, it does seem like there's been a helpful shift from the last administration to this administration, but the question is, is that really making a difference or not? And I, you know, that's where I just don't know. I mean, we, we know that there are people in the rank and file at USDA who do work hard um, and try to help people with their civil rights cases. A lot of the criticism in the past has been directed at the management. So we haven't, investigated since our article came out in 2019. Can I say one thing? Yeah. I mean, so I think that's maybe a useful distinction. But there's, there's, so there's a, there's a group of folks with the USDA's Economic Research Service that are incredibly interested in Nair's property. They're going to have a June convening. I'm, uh, I think I'm giving the keynote. Um, and then you have, I mean, we have one of those folks came to the Harvard event. And is he here? He's here in the back of the room. Like, um, and then Latrice Hill who's with, what, FSA, um, is from Mississippi. She was supposed to be here today. So, so the point is there, there, are, there are a number of folks of goodwill who are doing really good work, right? So, um, so I think that's, you know, um, I, I think we need to acknowledge that as well. So we've got, let's, let's get, um, let's try and get a couple of questions if we've got some, some rapid fire and then we'll, yes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Charnett Trimble, and I'm the founder and executive director of Grandmama's House. And specifically, uh, I teach workshops on heirs' property prevention and estate planning. And this is directed to Dr. Mitchell. Do you have any financial literacy materials that you are aware of that will complement heirs' property prevention? 
And I'm not talking about down payment assistance or credit repair. I'm talking about something that would lift up, you know, low income black people and elevate their mental, their fit financial literacy to uh, beyond, you know, what you do in your typical, you know, down payment and that kind of thing. Because a 65 year old black woman don't need credit repair. Mm-hmm. You know, she needs to have understanding about how to pass on her home to the next generation. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm looking for. Were, were you going to echo that, or were you had something else to add? Yeah, I wanted to echo that because um, I just was thinking about the fact that I often hear that um, um, ignorance of the law, you know, is not, you know, there's no excuse. Yet, the majority of Philadelphians in my city don't understand that there's no such thing as an automatic transfer of wealth. So they don't know the process of probate. And so that's why we have all those tangled titles in the city of Philadelphia, because people assume, you know, that's air property. I automatically inherit because I'm the only child or, you know, I'm the next of kin. And what responsibility do the government have in educating um, homeowners or even children who often become orphans? What responsibility is it of the government to educate the citizens uh, of the United States on how to properly transfer their generational wealth? Yeah, so I think this is going to have to be the last question if we're going to slow down the rate that we're falling behind. Um, so I think that there's, you know, from my perspective, there's, there's good news just, you know, oftentimes people say, how are you doing? And I say always, that implies, well, what's your baseline? So for me, it's easy. My baseline was that there was nothing, <laughs> there was hardly anything happened. It was some bare cabinets uh, 25 years ago when I got to work. I mean, not that, that there were good community-based organizations and public interest, but there just wasn't a whole lot. So I'm actually heartened that we uh, can have a conference, and you mentioned heirs' property, and more than one person in the room actually knows what that is. I'm heartened that uh, until about seven years ago, there wasn't a single first-year law property textbook that mentioned heirs' property, and now there's eight or nine. So, you know, our, stu- our students at here at BC, not even once just in my section, you say heirs' property, and about, you know, at least half of them are like, yeah, I've heard of that. Um, so that's kind of progress. The what I'd say on, on um, that front, yes, yeah, certainly, I think. And I think what you're doing in Philadelphia, what the folks are doing in San Antonio, uh, government officials, there's some folks in Austin doing the same thing. We need a lot more of that. Um, there are um, one of the goals of our initiative, and we're not trying to solve all the problems. We are one law school, one little initiative. Right now with limited funding, I hope the funding we're able to attract more to do more. But one of the things we want to do is community legal education, right? So obviously we're not going to be doing a 1,000 of these, but we're trying to make our contribution and hope uh, to uh, stimulate others. So all, all, all I'll say is that... Um, the number of organizations in the urban and rural environment that have been working on heirs' property compared to 25 years ago has totally multiplied. I don't know if Scott Kolnowski from the City Bar Justice Center in New York made it here today. He registered, but um, they've been doing uh, great work. The Center for Heirs' Property Preservation in Charleston, South Carolina, has been doing great work. There's the Georgia Heirs' Property Law Center. So here's the one thing I'll say is like, Kind of busy right now. Uh, I've been kind of burning the candle at both ends after the conference is over today, and after I give my keynote tonight, I'm gonna just work 50 hours next week. Um, but there are, you know, what we can do is pull together uh, a group of organizations that have been doing this work. There's a, uh, Vermont Law School has a center, an uh, agriculture and food law center, but they have a woman there who is doing heirs' property work. She's been putting together incredible uh, materials. Um, There's that Southern Rural Development Corporation that's kind of an umbrella group of a lot of um, um, uh, various universities that are mostly agriculture, and they've been doing a lot of stuff. So there are some, there's a constellation of organizations. Some of them actually have been putting together the kind of stuff you want. And so maybe, um, you know, I can help put you in touch or we can have a project where we are able to consolidate some of that information. But the government, like, what thing? Oh, I, I agree with that, right? You know. Um, like, if you, if you want us to do, you know, air property, you know, may not be heard of anywhere, what responsibility of the United States government to teach their citizens the war war?
Yeah, we're, we're yeah. now getting the hook. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. All right, folks. I was so sorry, but yeah, we're going to have to wrap this up. But thank you so much. Please join me in uh, another round on our panelists.